This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to the University of California Davis Health System. Since 1973, Continuing Medical Education, CME, has been an integral part of the educational mission of the UC Davis School of Medicine and Medical Center. The Center for Health and Technology, CHT, increases access to health education and promotes interaction between patients, physicians, and other healthcare professionals through the use of telecommunications and computer technology. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen D. Brass. I'm Director of Neurology Sleep Clinical Program at UC Davis Medical Center. And this afternoon, I will be covering sleep and the primary care physician. I have nothing to disclose, no personal or financial conflicts of interest to report. However, I will be discussing some off-label, non-FDA approved use of some medications. In this talk, we will be covering three objectives. We will review case-based series, the differential diagnosis of sleep complaints that may present to the PCP's office. We will review as well the suggested diagnostic workup of patients presenting with such complaints. And we will review evidence-based treatments of common sleep disorders. Before we begin, I want to talk in general a little bit about the background of sleep and the importance of sleep. We spend one third of our life asleep. And if you live till age 70, that translates to 27 years. How much sleep do we need? The amount of sleep that we need varies across a lifespan. Infants tend to require between 10 and a half to 18 hours of sleep. Usually this sleep is not a continuous 10 or 18 hour block. It tends to be two hours of sleep followed by two hours of wake. And as the infant ages, what happens is the sleep becomes more consolidated. Children require between 10 to 13 hours of sleep. Adolescents may need nine and a quarter hours of sleep. And adults or the, or the elderly require between seven to nine hours of sleep. In terms of how much sleep do we get, in general, Americans are a very sleep-deprived society. Although in general we require seven to eight hours of sleep, we don't get the actual requirements. 71% of adult Americans sleep less than eight hours per night, and 40% of adult Americans sleep less than seven hours per night, based on a National Sleep Foundation telephone poll conducted in 2005. I want to just explain to you uh, through a diagram called a hypnogram how sleep is divided. This is a representation called a hypnogram where we have eight hours of sleep for one young adult and that we see that sleep is divided into two parts. The REM stage of sleep which is designated in red and then the non-REM which is divided into stage one, two, three, and four. And actually, the latest guidelines from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine have combined stage three and four. What we see is the person starts off at the beginning of the night awake, and they go into a lighter stage one. And then as the night proceeds, we see them follow into step two, three, four, back to three, two, then REM. And as the night gets goes on, the REM sleep gets longer and longer as the night proceeds, um, as designated by the red bars, which are becoming longer and longer. We tend to have our sleep alternating between non-REM sleep and REM sleep, and this cycle occurs every 90 minutes. REM sleep 
is the time where we dream. REM sleep stands for rapid eye movement. It's a stage of sleep where we are dreaming and the rest of the body is typically paralyzed. And the understanding of REM sleep and the noting that REM sleep tends to occur towards the end of the night has clinical significance as certain disorders such as sleep apnea or REM sleep behavior disorder tend to occur more towards that time of the night, towards the end of the night when REM sleep is more predominant. What are the types of sleep disorders that we see? There are more than 80 types of sleep disorders per the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and close to 50 to 70 million Americans suffer from a sleep disorder, yet most go undiagnosed and are untreated. And it is often the primary care physician who is on the first line seeing these patients and dealing with these sleep complaints. The consequence of not sleeping are serious. And we know that some of the consequences include hypertension, motor vehicle accidents, diabetes, cardiac disease, and one of the most important is the quality of life of the individuals affected by problems with sleep. I want to uh, continue with some cases that were actually referred to the sleep clinic. The names and the identities of these cases were changed. The first case is Paul. He's a 54-year-old male, and he comes in with a chief complaint of I'm always falling asleep at work. He tends to go to bed at 10 p.m., falls asleep a minute later. His alarm is at 7 a.m. He wakes up three times per night to urinate. He snores heavily, worse on his back, and he has gained 40, 40 pounds over the past year. He feels sleepy during the day. His Epworth sleepiness scale, which we'll cover later, is a 12 on 24. He reports no car accidents. So we have a patient presenting with a chief complaint of excessive daytime sleepiness, and there's a, a differential diagnosis that one may think of when approaching one such patient. One of the most common causes of excessive daytime sleepiness is insufficient sleep, not getting the seven to eight hours of sleep a night, and that needs to be explored uh, carefully with the patient history. Other um, things to keep up in the differential include sleep apnea, medication side effect, notably pain medications, depression, which may cause complaints of excessive daytime sleepiness, and is actually one of the DSM criteria for depression, drug dependence or abuse, traumatic brain injury may present with excessive daytime sleepiness, brain tumors rarely but can present with um, excessive daytime sleepiness, and other sleep disorders such as narcolepsy, which classically presents with excessive daytime sleepiness, and then circadian rhythm disorders such as shift workers or jet lag may present with complaints of excessive daytime sleepiness. When we see a patient who is complaining of excessive daytime sleepiness, it's important to remember to go back to the basics. We take a, a sleep history and we focus in on other uh, medical disorders that may be present that may be contributing to excessive daytime sleepiness. We take in, focus in on psychiatric history as well. We do a complete exam. We have the patient fill out an upward sleepiness scale as well as a stopping score, which helps to um, look at sleep apnea risk factors. We may ask the patient to complete a two-week sleep diary to look at how their sleep, uh, their patterns that they're keeping over two weeks um, to get an idea whether they're actually getting their eight hours of sleep and what is the shift. Are they a delayed shift or an advanced shift? And we consider certain workup in these patients such as a CBC, a thyroid, or a drug screen. And then we may consider a polysomnogram depending on the situation. Here on this um, slide we see an example of the Epworth sleepiness scale. It's a score that comes out of 24 and it's based on um, asking patients to evaluate their own self and their chance of dozing off in the following situations. 
And this score of 0, 1, 2, and 3, 0 is translated to no chance of dozing, 1 is a slight chance, 2 is a moderate, and 3 is a high chance of dozing. And then there's uh, various situations that are noted, um, sitting and reading, watching television, sitting in a public place, as a passenger in a car, lying down to, to rest in the afternoon, sitting and talking to someone, um, sitting quietly after lunch without alcohol in a car while stopped in traffic. And we have the patient fill this in. Often I do it in the waiting room. And a score of 10 or higher out of 24 suggests excessive daytime sleepiness. It doesn't diagnose the cause of the excessive daytime sleepiness. It can be that the patient was up the entire night. Um, how it can be positive in sleep apnea or narcolepsy. It is, however, sensitive to pick up excessive daytime sleepiness. The second uh, questionnaire that I have my patients complete when I evaluate patients with excessive daytime sleepiness is a stop bank questionnaire. This was a questionnaire that came out of um, the anesthesiology literature in Canada where they were screening patients preoperatively for sleep apnea and they used these eight questions and what was found is that scoring three or more of the eight positive on this stop bang questionnaire puts you at high risk of obstructive sleep apnea. And this has been validated in several different populations and in, in not only in the preoperative setting but actually in the primary care physician as a means to screen for obstructive sleep apnea as a sensitive uh, test. And there's various questions that are involved and one of them, the first one is do you snore loudly and they're yes or no questions. Are you, are you often tired or fatigued? Has anyone observed you to stop breathing? Are you treated for high blood pressure? Is your BMI over 35? Is your age over 50? Is your neck size over 40 centimeters or 15 and a half inches? And is your gender male? And notice the stop bang is um, a mnemonic, an abbreviation for the different questions, the eight questions involved in the stop bang. And scoring three or more would suggest that the patient is high risk for obstructive sleep apnea and consideration for testing for obstructive sleep apnea should be considered. And I just wanted to um, show you the predictive parameters for the stop bang uh, from the original paper. We have the um, sensitivities and the specific specificities as well as the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. And we note that um, the the sensitivities are quite high and it tends to be more sensitive for more, um, the more severe apneas and uh, we'll cover that soon. The apnea hypopnea index over 30 uh, is, is more severe than the apnea hypopnea index over 5 and we note that the sensitivity is greater for the more severe uh, disease. So based on our evaluation, the history of the exam, our uh, and as well as the Epworth and the stop bang, we feel that uh, ordering a polysomnogram is indicated. I want to just show you what one goes through when one has a polysomnogram in the laboratory. We uh, usually look at both the uh, EEG component to look at brain activity. We uh, have some EMGs near the eye to look for eye movements. We, we look at uh, airflow coming from the nose and mouth as well as chin tone. There's also thoracic and abdominal belts to look for respiratory effort. And we put on EMGs on the legs to look for leg movements to document periodic leg movements. And here is a sample of a polysomnogram. This is a 60-second uh, sample. And one notes in the first um, two leads what one notes are the brain activity, and the following two leads from the top are the eye activities, and we actually see the blue marks indicate eye movements, followed by chin tone, and then we have the EKG lead, and then we have the snore channel, and then the flow, both from the mouth and then flow from the nose, 
indicated as, as uh, the NAF. And then we have the thoracic and abdominal belt, as well as the O2 saturation. And one notes that at the beginning of, on the left-hand side of the page, we see uh, good airflow and we see abdominal and thoracic activity. And then as in the middle of the page where the arrow is, we see that it becomes flat, the airflow. And this is what is designated as an apnea. We see 10 seconds of, of no airflow uh, is designated as an apnea. And this is um, the definition, and we tabulate the apneas. And then hypopnea is 10 seconds of a reduction of airflow. Uh, we tabulate the apneas and hypopneas, and we divide it by the sleep time to derive an apnea hypopnea index. And this allows us to communicate the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. The severity of sleep apnea is based on the apnea hypopnea index. It's it's the unit is events per hour. Mild sleep apnea is uh, defined as having an AHI or apnea hypopnea index of five to 14 events per hour. Moderate sleep apnea is defined as having an apnea hypopnea index from 15 to 29 per hour. And severe obstructive sleep apnea is defined as having an apnea hypopnea index greater than 30 per hour. There are several other parameters that show up on the sleep report that I just wanted to cover with you. Other issues to look at or other points to consider is the total sleep time. Did the patient actually sleep in the lab? One of the causes of a false negative sleep study occur when a patient goes into the lab and doesn't even sleep. So one of the things to look at is the total sleep time. The sleep efficiency is defined as the total sleep time over the time in bed. And in general, we strive, or what is considered a good sleep efficiency is 85% or higher. We look at the total apnea hypopnea index, which I already went through, is a sum of the apneas and hypopneas for the total sleep time. And then we also look at the apnea hypopnea index in various uh, other parameters, notably in REM sleep. And like I noted that in REM sleep, one could get, see a worsening of obstructive sleep apnea. And that is because uh, all the muscles are paralyzed except for the eye muscles in the diaphragm. And it leads to further increased collapse of the airway. And that leads to a worsening of obstructive sleep apnea. And often uh, patients may have a mild uh, apnea hypopnea index overall, but in REM sleep, it may become severe. So it's always important to look not only at the total apnea hypopnea index, but at the REM apnea hypopnea index, so which in this patient is quite high. And then we have the non-REM apnea hypopnea index. And then we have two, two other parameters, the supine apnea hypopnea index. And that's because obstructive sleep apnea tends to get worse in the supine position because of gravity encourages closure of the airway and the non-supine apnea hypopnea index. We also look at the oxygen need or the lowest O2 um, of the night. And they, these numbers give you an idea of the type of sleep apnea and the severity of sleep apnea. There are some patients who tend to have more positional sleep apnea who have very severe supine, uh, a, uh, supine apnea hypopnea index, high apnea hypopnea index. However, in non-supine sleep, it may be very low, and their obstructive sleep apnea tends to be very positional, and it may be more responsive to positional therapy, such as avoiding supine sleep. So let's go on to talk a little bit about obstructive sleep apnea. It's a very common disorder in which you have one or more pauses in breathing or shallow breaths while you sleep. It is defined as having an apnea hypopnea index greater than five events per hour with daytime symptoms or an apnea hypopnea index greater than 15 with no symptoms needed. The daytime symptoms we will cover tends to be sleepiness, cognitive complaints. Close to 18 million people in the United States have obstructive sleep apnea based on estimates. However, the most people are undiagnosed. 10 million people are undiagnosed. It is believed that four 
to 9% of middle-aged men have obstructive sleep apnea, and 2 to 4% of middle-aged women have sleep apnea. This is a huge problem in the United States, the undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, and the problem is getting worse with the obesity epidemic. I want to talk to you a little bit about who's at risk for obstructive sleep apnea. The classic uh, patient is a male, middle-aged male who is overweight. We tend to see it more commonly among patients in general with obstructive sleep apnea of people of Asian descent or Pacific Islanders or African American tend to be at higher risk for sleep apnea. And most notably in people of Asian descent, body mass index may be less of a factor. There's often a history of snoring. There is often a family history of, obstru of obstructive sleep apnea or snoring present. And there may be genetic conditions that predispose to obstructive sleep apnea, such as Pratt or Willie syndrome. There may be a large tongue. There may be a history of enlarged tonsils or adenoids. The patients often will have a small chin or maxilla or mandible, and they usually have a short, thick neck. And in terms of the size, we note that 17 inches in male for neck circumference puts you at increased risk for obstructive sleep apnea. And for females, 16 inches is felt to be put females at increased risk for obstructive sleep apnea. I want to talk to you a little bit about the symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. The cardinal symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea is daytime sleepiness. And the reason why we have daytime sleepiness is because the apneas and the hypopneas often result in arousals from sleep as a protective mechanism to encourage you to restart breathing. Your brain wakes you up. And this sleep arousals that occur over the course of the night lead to sleep fragmentation. And at the, at the following day, patients often feel unrefreshed because of the multiple arousals that have occurred over the course of the night. Patients may complain of daytime sleepiness. Women tend to use the term fatigue or tired rather than sleepy. The other common symptom is snoring. 90% of patients with sleep apnea report snoring. It frequently disrupts the bed partner. There's also a history of having witnessed apneic episodes where a bed partner will, will report that they've seen their spouse stop breathing. Other symptoms that have been reported with sleep apnea include awakening with headache, awakening with a dry throat, Patients may report awakening, gasping for air, or feeling like they're being smothered. They may report nocturia, wake, waking up multiple times to, use, uh, to urinate, and that may be directly related to sleep apnea. They may report GERD. They may report a restless sleep and memory impairment. In terms of the approach to treating sleep apnea, there are several different approaches that we use. Behavioral, CPAP, oral appliances, and surgery. And I'm going to cover these in detail. In terms of behavioral, it's always important to encourage patients to maintain a normal body mass index. Although it is not a guarantee that having a normal body mass index will eliminate obstructive sleep apnea, it often reduces the severity of obstructive sleep apnea, reduces CPAP pressure requirement, and is helpful for other cardiovascular diseases that the patient is at risk for. It's also important to eliminate any sedating medication, which may be predisposing to obstruction. We encourage patients to eliminate tobacco use, which has been shown in studies to have an impact on the severity of sleep apnea. And reducing alcohol not only reduces um, the severity of sleep apnea, it reduces sleep fragmentation, as alcohol is known to lead to sleep fragmentation. And we encourage patients, especially if they have positional sleep apnea, to avoid supine sleep. I wanted to talk to you about CPAP, which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, which essentially serves as a splint 
to keep the airway open. It is uh, normal room air which is pressurized that is di delivered via a mask whereby the patient wears this on a nightly basis with the aim of keeping the airway open, preventing the apneas, and therefore pre preventing further arousals as well. The response to CPAP is often dramatic. I want to show you the different masks that are available, and it's important because patients will often um, note that if they have certain issues that come up with masks um, or if they're having trouble with CPAP compliance, sometimes changing masks may be helpful. So in the top uh, left-hand corner, we have the, um, a full face mask. We have at the bottom, we have a nasal mask. And then the top right-hand corner, we have the nasal pillow mask. The nasal pillow are, have two prongs which enter the nose. The bottom mask, the nasal mask, covers just the nose. And the top left is a full face mask which covers both the nose and mouth. There's a certain percentage of patients who don't comply with CPAP or who don't want to consider CPAP which is considered actually the first line therapy and the most effective therapy. And we, we offer alternatives to CPAP and what we would offer for mild to moderate sleep apnea are the use of oral appliances. Uh, this is often made by a sleep dentist. There's two types of oral appliances. One that advance the tongue and we see that on the left hand side at the bottom and the other type of appliance is one that advances the mandible. It, by advancing the mandible forward while you sleep, the appliance uh, prevents the a tongue from falling to the back of the throat. It expands the airway and reduces the risk for apneas. Like I noted, this is best indicated for mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. And usually after CPAP, has, has uh, been tried. Surgery is sometimes an option. We usually don't consider it first line. Some of the surgeries that have been used in for obstructive sleep apnea are listed here. There are several more surgeries that I have not listed. The first one is uh, the UPPP or uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty. The second is an, a maxillomandibular advancement surgery. And the third is a trache tracheostomy, which is seldom used these days, but used in the past to treat very severe sleep apnea. And in the bottom right-hand corner, we see a pre and post UPPP surgery. We see part of the uvula, palate, and tonsils have been resected. In the bottom left-hand corner, we see the maxillomandibular advancement surgery. We see there's a... Uh, um, surgical scars in the maxilla and mandible, and we see the maxilla and mandible have been moved forward. The MMA surgery is extremely effective surgery for obstructive sleep apnea, and the literature um, nowadays has shown that the UPPP surgery, the uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty surgery, tends to have less, less uh, favorable results in the long term. And the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has come up with some parameters and some guidelines for surgery in the obstructive sleep apnea population that I uh, suggest referring to for further details uh, regarding the different surgical options. And I want to emphasize that CPAP tends to be the first line therapy that we often offer to our patients. However, whenever we evaluate patients, we go through the risk and benefit and discuss alternatives of all the options available to them. However, the efficacy for a CPAP is the highest and is shown to be the most effective compa compared to the other treatment modalities. So whenever we're seeing a patient who has obstructive sleep apnea, we always approach behavioral interventions regardless of how severe the sleep apnea is 
And we usually will encourage CPAP as first line, which has been shown to be effective in mild and moderate and severe sleep apnea. And for patients who may not tolerate CPAP or choose otherwise, we may decide to go ahead with uh, referring them to a sleep dentist for an oral appliance, which is best suited for patients with mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. We may consider surgery in severe cases of obstructive sleep apnea, especially if they are intolerant of CPAP. And the literature nowadays is moving away of supporting UPPP and is showing greater benefit or, uh, for the maxillomandibular advancement type surgery. The second case I want to present to you is Rob. He's a 66-year-old male, and he comes in with a chief complaint. I am sleepy even though I'm on CPAP. He's in bed at 1 in the morning, asleep at 1.20. His alarm is at set for 6 in the morning. He wakes up one time per night to urinate. He claims to wear his CPAP religiously. However, he, feel, he, he feels sleepy. His Epworth is 14 on 24. And remember, I want to remind you that an Epworth of 10 or higher is considered diagnostic for excessive daytime sleepiness. So what is the differential diagnosis for patients who have persistent sleepiness on CPAP? So the first one is CPAP compliance. It is very important to always ask the patient about how often they are using the CPAP. And nowadays, a lot of the CPAP machines have compliance data cards built into them, which allow, you, allow us to, as clinicians, to document whether or not they are actually compliant. And reports can be generated and sent to your office showing the compliance of the patient which gives you a, an idea about objective data regarding compliance. Other issues that come up to why someone on CPAP may be sleepy is inadequate CPAP pressure. I see many, many patients in my practice who come in with extremely old masks who may have a leak from the mask um, because the plastic is worn down. And because of that, what happens is the pressure may be inadequate. Patients may be using a nasal pillow mask and may be opening their mouth over the course of the day, or over the course of the night, and because of that may have an oral leak, and therefore the pressure from the CPAP may not be adequate. They may require a chin strap. And the third issue where CPAP pressure may not be adequate, if there's been a significant weight gain um, and we know that 10 to 15 pounds may require an increase in CPAP pressure. So if there's been a significant weight gain since their last CPAP titration study and they're still feeling sleepy, one needs to think that the pressure that they're set at may be inadequate. Another very important point, as in our patient that we presented, is insufficient sleep. We recommend, in general, for adults to sleep between seven to nine hours a night of sleep. And if you're sleeping less than seven hours of sleep, even if you're using your CPAP, it may explain persistent sleepiness on CPAP. Other medical conditions to note are depression, pain, medical conditions like thyroid disease, heart failure, may present with continued sleepiness despite using CPAP, medications, like narcotics, antiepileptics, may, or antidepressants may all present with persistent sleepiness despite CPAP. And then another sleep disorder other than sleep apnea should also be considered, such as narcolepsy, periodic leg movement disorder, which may contribute to persistent sleepiness on CPAP. And then there's a certain percentage of patients who have persistent sleepiness despite optimal therapy, and that may be related to the long-term effects of sleep apnea on the brain, which we are still trying to understand the pathophysiology of. When you're looking at CPAP compliance, the literature has various reports of how compliant patients are. In one study, at six months, it was noted that the compliance rate 
ran anywhere from 65 to 85 percent. And when we compare that to asthma medication compliance, which runs in, let's say, 30 percent, the CPAP compliance is actually higher than that which was reported with asthma medication compliance. So although it's not perfect, it still may be better to some other um, medications that our uh, patients are on as well. And I want to just show you here an example of a compliance report that can be downloaded from the actual CPAP machine from the chip at the back. And what you'll often get is this 20-page document, and then there'll be a summary page on the last page. And you could often flip to the summary page and look at a couple of these numbers. And the first number to look at is the percentage of days with device usage. And you could look at the date range as well, from what date to what date. The second is the the second is the um, average use on days used. So you want to know, on average, when the patient actually did use it, how many hours did they use it for? And the third is the percent of days with greater than or equal to four hours of use. And the reason why that's relevant is Medicare has come up with some guidelines regarding compliance that they require a 70% compliance over the first 90 days for greater than four hours per night on average in order for them to continue reimbursing for CPAP. So those are some of the key numbers to look at when you receive your compliance report. Some of the newer models of CPAP actually have an apnea hypopnea index that the machine actually is able to uh, actually print out for you. It's actually able to sense whether the patient is having apneas or hypopneas. And the, the printout will often show you what pressure the patient is set at. I want to just talk about a couple of strategies that can be used to improve CPAP compliance. It is very important that once the patient is started on CPAP to follow the patient closely. Both clinical follow-up as well as the durable medical equipment company which started the patient on CPAP or is helping to set the patient up on CPAP should be also following the patient closely as well. Things that can help improve compliance if the patient is having problems with masks, I often encourage the patient to potentially switch masks. If they're on a nasal pillow, I may switch them to a nasal mask. If they're on a full face mask and they're feeling claustrophobic, I may switch them to nasal pillows. Patients uh, who are on CPAP often benefit from having a humidifier built into their CPAP that adds some comfort as the air is more comfortable. There's a ramp setting on the CPAP machine. The ramp setting allows the pressure to build up gradually. So if the patient is set at, let's say, 12 centimeters, the CPAP will start at four centimeters and over a ramp, let's say, of over 30 minutes, will slowly build up to 12 centimeters, allowing easier um, comfort for the patient as the higher pressure builds up. One may also consider desensitization. There is some companies and some sleep labs that actually work with the patient to desensitize them to the use of CPAP by having them actually wear the CPAP during the day or come into the lab during the day, try on different masks and try to sleep with the mask on. And they may use imagery or relaxation techniques to help them feel more comfortable with the CPAP. I often encourage my patients to put on the CPAP mask and the machine during the day and actually watch television with it or try to read with it in order to desensitize to the use of CPAP. However, the most important among all these techniques is education, educating the patient why sleep apnea needs to be treated and how effective CPAP is that is crucial to improve your patient's compliance for CPAP. I want to move on now, and we're going to talk about Jennifer. Jennifer is a 57-year-old female. She comes in with a chief complaint of, I have insomnia, need a sleeping pill. She has no other medical problems and has a normal exam. She describes that her legs feel like they're pulling at night. She 
she needs to get up from her bed and walk around. And her husband complains that she kicks in her sleep to a point where the husband is no longer sleeping in the bed. So before we go on to focus in on Jennifer's problem, I want to just clarify the diagnosis of insomnia. So insomnia is primarily a clinical diagnosis. It's made by history. And essentially, it's trouble going to sleep, staying asleep, waking up too early. And if it's chronic, it's usually more than 30 days. And patients, in order to qualify for the diagnosis of insomnia, they must have daytime consequences from the insomnia, such as trouble with concentration, complaints of fatigue, anxiety, memory problems related to the insomnia. It is often important for the primary care physician when approaching a patient complaining of insomnia to look for secondary causes of insomnia, such as psychiatric illness, such as depression or anxiety, or intrinsic sleep disorders. One may think of circadian rhythm disorders, such as a shift worker, or patients with sleep apnea who may complain of multiple, waken, multiple wakenings at night or waking up early and they may come in to you with a complaint of insomnia. And another common sleep disorder which may come in complaining of insomnia is restless leg syndrome. It's often helpful for the patients to complete a sleep diary so you could actually document what time they went to bed at, what time they woke up at, how many hours they're sleeping, and what exacerbates their insomnia, or what improves their insomnia. And Polysomnography is not usually indicated as a part of the workup for insomnia unless you suspect obstructive sleep apnea as a cause of the insomnia. I want to move on to Jennifer and uh, just let you know that Jennifer's symptoms were her insomnia was likely related to restless leg syndrome. And I want to just go over with you what is restless leg syndrome. And the diagnostic criteria for restless leg syndrome is quite easy to remember if you remember the mnemonic URGE, U-R-G-E. URGE, U. It's an urge to move limbs. It tends to be the legs, but may occur in the arms. Rest tends to worsen symptoms. The symptoms may come on often in, while the patient is waiting to fall asleep at night. They may report symptoms while they're a passenger in a long car ride or on the airplane. Getting up to, uh, it often improves the symptoms. Moving their legs, shaking their legs, walking around, getting up from the bed while they're having the symptoms often relieves these symptoms. And there's a diurnal pattern that RLS symptoms tend to get worse at night in the evening. Patients with restless leg will sometimes use this word as an urge to move their legs, but more often they'll use other terminology, and the clinician has to be aware of this, and it, otherwise it can make you go down the wrong diagnostic path. Patients with restless leg may report the symptom of an urge to move as burning, aching, throbbing, shock-like, ants, or even Elvis legs. RLS, is extremely common. 12 million Americans have restless leg syndrome. 5 to 15 percent of the population. It occurs more commonly in females and restless leg syndrome is often misdiagnosed. It's often misdiagnosed as insomnia, as leg cramps, as arthritis, peripheral arterial disease, or psychiatric. When we think of Causes of RLS, we tend to divide it into genetic causes, which are thought to be primary. And we now know that there are some genes associated with restless leg syndrome that may run in the family. Um, other secondary causes of restless leg include iron deficiency anemia, uremia, pregnancy, neurological diseases such as neuropathy, and there are certain medications that have been known to exacerbate restless leg, including SSRIs, tricyclics, and neuroleptics. 
when we think about the treatment of restless leg syndrome, we divide it up into non-pharmacological and pharmacological. In non-pharmacological, it's always important to rule out, first of all, um, secondary causes, looking at some of the medications that the patients may be taking. Uh, we also encourage the patient to avoid caffeine. We ask from um, patients uh, to approach the pharmacological uh, aspect of treating restless leg when the disturbance of restless leg is occurring more than two to three times a week and, it and when it's interfering with their sleep and causing insomnia. One of the things that we do as part of the workup is we look for both the iron, we look at the ferritin level, we look at the BUN creatine, and if it's a female, we, look, we do a pregnancy test. If the ferritin is less than 50 nanograms per milliliter, we consider re iron replacement with ferrous sulfate, 325 milligrams BID or TID as a first line therapy, as this has been shown to be helpful in treating restless leg. Other medications that have shown to be helpful for treatment of restless leg is um, dopamine agonists, similar medications used to treat Parkinson's. Um, we have the ropirinol and the premipexol. Both medications are considered FDA approved medications for restless leg syndrome. There's a newer medication that has uh, come out, gabapentin and carbaryl, that has been shown to be helpful in treating restless leg syndrome. And opiates, as a final resort, have been used as an off label treatment for restless leg syndrome. And is usually after dopamine agonists and iron have been already tried. In terms of the different causes of restless leg, we already uh, went through this. Uh, again, just to remind you, there's genetic causes. There is the Irish iron deficiency anemia. And I want to emphasize that it's really important to work that up and ensure that there's not another cause of anemia present before just starting the patient on iron. Uremia can be associated with this. And dialysis patients are at high risk for restless leg syndrome. Pregnancy has been associated with restless leg syndrome. And again, examining the patient for neuropathy, peripheral arterial disease, and then looking at, again, their medication list. The last case is Sam. And this is a 70-year-old male. And he comes in that he has a black eye. He comes in with his wife. And his wife says he's been fighting in his sleep. And he fell off the bed and hit the table. There's no symptoms or signs to suggest sleep apnea. His stop bang is negative. He denies that he's sleepy, and he denies any other medical problems, any recreational drug use or depression. His Epworth is 9 on 24. And this is a picture of Sam. And we see him and his wife in this picture. And Sam is dreaming. And in his dream, he's dreaming that he was punching someone, and he was also acting out his dream. And you have to remember, when we dream, we're often in REM sleep. And normally, REM sleep, our body should be paralyzed and, and in order to prevent us from acting out our dream. So the ability to act out your dream uh, is abnormal phenomena. And we call this disorder REM sleep behavior disorder. And REM sleep behavior disorder often occurs in older males. And it may be the heralding symptom of Parkinson's disease. And there's various statistics that have been shown to be associate, associated with Parkinson's disease. And some of the literature reports that close to 50% of patients in 10 years will develop Parkinson's disease if they present with REM sleep behavior disorder. Patients will often have complex motor activities in REM sleep, and they often will act out their vivid dreams. There's a serious risk of injury to, the, to themselves or to their bed partner. It occurs in the second half of the night when REM sleep is greatest. I want to show you an example of a REM sleep behavior disorder from a sleep lab. We see this patient is in the sleep lab, 
and they're going, they're in REM sleep, and REM sleep is a time when you're supposed to be completely paralyzed. And what is going on in this video, which we'll see shortly, is that this patient, despite being in REM sleep, is actually has arisen and is actually fighting and, at, and punching. The treatment for REM sleep behavior disorder is number one, to take a history and exam, evaluate the patient for Parkinson's disease, ensure environmental safety in the bedroom. You want to move the nightstands away from the bed. You want to put padding on the floor. You want to remove any guns from the bedroom. You want to have alarms on the door, the windows, or any doors leading to balconies. You want to remove any possible triggers, such as SSRIs, which has been associated with REM sleep behavior disorder. The treatments tend to fall into either clonazepam at low dose, from 0.25 to 2 milligrams, and the other medication that is shown to be effective is melatonin, usually in doses from 3 to 12 milligrams. So I want to just end with summarizing what we covered today in our talk. And we, in our talk, we've covered several points. We covered the differential diagnosis of excessive daytime sleepiness, the clinical features of obstructive sleep apnea, how to screen for obstructive sleep apnea using the stop bang. We covered the sensitivity and specificity of this test, how to read the polysomnogram report and what a polysomnogram epic looks like, we discussed different treatment options for sleep apnea. I went through the differential diagnosis for residual sleepiness on a patient presenting on CPAP. We discussed the diagnostic criteria for restless leg syndrome, the treatment of restless leg syndrome. We discussed as well what uh, secondary causes of restless leg syndrome may, may be. We also discussed the diagnostic criteria for REM sleep behavior disorder and the treatment of REM sleep behavior disorder. And I would like to thank you very much for being with me over the course of this hour. Thank you very much.